the best, the worst, the most influential, the most disappointing, Minecraft. January has already been flooded with lists about gaming. There are so many best and worst lists that there are actually more lists than people to watch them. So today, I am going to do something a little bit different. Today, we are going to talk about the most forgettable games of the decade. Apologies if I forgot one of your favorites, but again, being forgettable is sort of what this list is about. I had to do some real research just to remember that I had played these in the first place. Oh yeah, that's also a criteria. I had to actually play the game that was on this list. Because there were some forgettable games that I didn't play because I totally forgot to play them. But basically these are the most forgettable games that I actually did play. We'll be taking a game from each of the last 10 years. And I should note that a game's lack of sustainability or influence does not denote that it is necessarily good or bad. Don't worry, I'll tell you which is which. 2010! Ah yes, the decade kicked off with some of the best titles of this generation, such as Mass Effect 2, Red Dead Redemption, and Fallout New Vegas. However, it was also the year of Power Gig Rise of the Six String, that's actually a pretty forgettable game, but I didn't play it, uh, APB, uh, Dark Void, and uh, Vanquish, so... Everything was not awesome. However, there was a game in 2010 that had the potential to stand the test of time, and instead it fell into utter obscurity. And this one is kind of painful because it comes from the near-legendary studio Obsidian. Yeah, Obsidian was having a very strange year. They created one of the best RPGs ever with New Vegas, but then they also created this original IP action RPG spy thriller thing called Alpha Protocol. You remember Alpha Protocol, right? No? That's not surprising, because while many of the games from this year that were bad were remembered for their badness or got an unnecessary re-release years later, APB, I'm looking at you, Alpha Protocol just kind of disappeared. It's really a shame, too, because it was basically the Mission Impossible game you never knew you wanted. It was structured sort of like Deus Ex, so you would go to one mission area and the choices that you made influenced what the, happened in the next mission, and so that's how the story kind of progressed, so you saw the effects of what you had done from uh, the previous area. Now, it definitely had its issues. Uh, you never really felt invested in the characters. I can't really even remember the main character's name. Like, I, it, totally blanking on it. Could look it up, but I just, it's not worth it. The characters were very forgettable. Even when some of them died because of choices that you made, I don't even remember who they were. But I do remember someone could die. Uh, the stealth gameplay, because there was a lot of stealth, had a tendency to devolve into a shooting gallery because things went wrong pretty quickly. And you never really felt like a covert operative. But Alpha Protocol was a very different kind of game that could have spawned this whole new genre of, like, spy RPGs. It didn't. And that's why it's on here. 2011! After waiting for more than a decade, gamers were finally regaled with Duke Nukem Forever. But that is not the most forgettable game of 2011, because you will never forget that tire fire, nor should you. However, there is another game from that year that I barely remember playing, and I only actually remembered that it existed because I saw the title pop up in games from that year. So... What can I tell you about Mind Jack? I think you played a guy named Jack. No, it was actually Jim. Sorry, they didn't want that to be too on the nose. Anyway, Jim has the ability to possess people's minds in combat. You, you see that he gets to jack into other people's minds, i.e. Mind Jack. Do you get it? Also, he's investigating this super secret government initiative called Project Mind Jack. You know, in case the subtlety was lost here. Now, this sounds like the kind of psychic combat that you might have remembered from previous games, like PsyOps and Second Sight, both of which released back in 2004, mind you. You are not far off. And just two years later, this kind of concept would be explored in Beyond Two Souls for more of a narrative, story-driven kind of game. Note that I remember that all of those other games existed. But in the middle of this psychic gaming storm, there was Mind Jack, a game that dared to be a 
pretty generic cover-based shooter title that had this one gimmick that kind of worked. Everything else was basically an uninteresting rehash of something that you had seen a ton of times before in a very overcrowded genre. The, the cover-based shooter part, not the psychic powers part, that was still pretty rare. But yeah, cover-based shooters, Gears of War was already out for a long time before that, so good job, Jack! Jim, sorry, it's it was Jim, right? Yeah, Jim, good. 2012, the year of the Mayan apocalypse. Hey folks, did you know this was the year that Game of Thrones got a video game tie-in? No, not the Telltale series. No, I'm, not, I'm not talking about that. No, like an actual RPG tie-in game. I'm pretty sure researching this list was the first time I even remembered that that was going to be a thing. I didn't even know it got released. I thought that maybe it just died before it ever got published. It was made by Cyanide. Yeah, that's a studio that's that's well known for other things. So strange. That should give it like a special honorary place as one of the most forgettable games of all time. But uh, note that I didn't play it, so I'm actually going to pick something different. Actually, 2012 was a banger year for games. You got your uh, Dishonored, you got your Journey, you got your XCOM, Walking Dead, the Telltale series, uh, Borderlands 2 released this year, Far Cry 3, Mass Effect 3, Diablo 3, and a really good cover-based shooter known as Spec Ops The Line, just to name a few. So it serves to reason that some games, even good ones, would fall beneath the cracks under the weight of such heavy hitters like these. One such game was Binary Domain, a third-person shooter that received a lot of praise from critics and is still actually rocking a 9 out of 10 on Steam. But you may only remember this game because I just said the title. Binary Domain featured squad-based combat where you could issue orders to your other team members, and it had something called the Consequence System, which is actually a really interesting idea, where uh, you would make choices, and the choices that you make actually affect how much the other members of your team trust you to make decisions. It also had a storyline that feels very relevant even to this day. So global warming causes all these floods, right? And so all these cities are underwater. So they start building all of these new cities on top of the old cities. And because so many people have died in the flooding and the natural disasters that occurred, uh, they have to start using robotic labor force as basically the primary means to get things done. But the advancements in robotics eventually lead to this problem where they end up with these things called hollow children. The robots look so lifelike that they could actually pass as humans. So the International Committee actually creates a law that bans research into it. And you play as one of the Rust crews that are sent off to enforce that law and make sure that nobody's actually building those hollow children. So you've got a dystopic future that features climate change, automation, natural disasters, and the ethical limits of uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah, that seems pretty pertinent to me. Despite all Binary Domain had going for it, it just didn't sell very well. Like in Japan, it did okay, but in North America, it just totally flopped. The producer for that game has said that he would be willing, interested even, to create a sequel to it. That was back in 2018, he had mentioned it. But honestly, there isn't a lot of demand for a trinary domain, from what I can tell. 2013! Boy, there were a lot of survival games in 2013. You had DayZ that people mostly hated, and then you had Rust, which uh, is more famous now for inspiring the term Rust clones than the game itself. But you see, the thing is, you remember those games? However, if I were to mention the title Seven Days to Die, you're probably going to be scratching your head asking, wait, did I play that? I indeed did play that, and I'm only now remembering the experience. Basically, imagine if Night of the Living Dead were set in Minecraft. Basically what they were going for. Of course, it really didn't do anything better than Minecraft, which had already been out for a few years. Uh, but it did have zombies, and it's not like there were zombies in Minecraft. 
So survival games are all over the map for me, and I usually bail on them when they become overly cumbersome. Conan Exiles, for example, gets to a point where in order to build the next thing you want to build, you have to wait 15 in-game hours to craft the necessary resources. It's just way too long. Seven Days to Die was a lot less grindy than that, but it had the problem of being kind of boring. So a zombie shambles up to you, and you hit it with your gardening tool of choice that you happen to stumble across, and then that breaks. So you've got to go and find another one, and then another zombie uh, comes up to you, and you hit it with that, and then that breaks. You know, basically, rinse and repeat. Most of the time you spend in the game is walking these large expanses of, like, desert or arctic tundra with very little to do while you're walking through that. Not a lot to collect, not a lot to explore, just this large open space and then occasionally a zombie comes by. When you're not in those areas, you find like cities and you can explore those and things pick up, but you know, there's a large expanse between those like suburban areas and, and populated ones where you actually have more zombie adventures. And if the whole idea is to not die, you also probably don't want to go there because there are zombies there, and that's pretty much the main way to die. It serves to reason that this sort of fell out of my head as soon as I put the controller down because, well, frankly, there was nothing memorable about it. You could actually do some of that building Minecrafty stuff in between getting attacked by zombies, but if you wanted that open world, procedurally generated survival game experience, there is that other game that I just mentioned, and I hear that's pretty popular. 2014! Plenty of big series got new installments in 2014, for better or worse. And then there were also a few new franchises that would later become series down the road. For instance, Wolfenstein New Order showed that the series actually had some serious narrative legs. Shadow of Mordor introduced the Nemesis system, which would be often copied after its release. Destiny became the very first Destiny clone. Assassin's Creed Rogue turned the whole Templar assassin narrative on its head, and Assassin's Creed Unity was around the time that most people bailed on the series. But among all these memorable memories, there were some smaller games that got lost in the shuffle. And the one that I want to talk about is actually from Ubisoft, a big company that had some big releases this year. But they also produced a really small game that never really did anything past its initial release. And that game is called Child of Light. For most people watching this, you probably never heard of this title or just saw it in passing. But it was actually a very engaging turn-based RPG experience that borrowed some elements from Metroidvania titles of the past and had this beautiful visual aesthetic that made the whole thing look like a children's picture book. Yeah, the art design was definitely a standout here. The overall gameplay and exploration weren't half bad either, and I could have easily seen this become another one of Ubisoft's annualized series as they copy-pasted that formula every single year into oblivion. But instead it was a one-and-done title with little fanfare, despite having overwhelming positive response from critics and players alike. While I can't speak for other gamers, I can say that I did not finish Child of Light and eventually put it down, moved on to other games, and sort of forgot about it completely until this moment. Yes, the memory of Child of Light soon faded into obscurity, very much like the picture books it embodies, probably because you spilled juice on it or left it outside in a storm. The, the books, not the game. I hope you didn't leave the game out in a storm. I guess you probably forgot about it. 2015. Oh yes, this was a year. In an era increasingly concerned with multiplayer games, 2015 was the kind of year that really made a case for single-player experiences. Metal Gear 5, The Phantom Pain, Fallout 4, Bloodborne, Undertale... And you know what? While we're at it, let's just toss in Assassin's Creed Syndicate, uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider, and Just Cause 3. Oh, yeah, there was also this little game called, I think it was called The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt? Yeah, I guess that was kind of important, too. 
But the emphasis on online multiplayer was becoming more prevalent all the time. In a world filled with free-for-all and team battlers, Evolve was going to try something new by having a group of hunters go up against one very powerful monster. This asymmetrical team-building experience may have set it apart from everything else in the pack, but it also faded into obscurity very soon after release. Support from Turtle Rock uh, ended the next year, and the servers were shut down in 2018. Yes, yes, you can play this as a single-player game, but it's basically just the multiplayer game with AIs working as the other members of the team. So it's not like a single-player campaign that you go through. I know because I tried it that one time for like an hour, and uh, yeah, I got very bored with it because I don't even think I saw the monster, and I quit before the match was up. You know, you sit in a match for like five, ten minutes, and there's literally nothing happening, and you're like, well, I don't really know what the point of this was. You would think you'd at least see a monster show up. I, I, I swear I don't remember a monster or what the monster was, so... This may have been a new idea in a crowded marketplace, but that doesn't always guarantee success. Later, this asymmetrical gameplay would be utilized to better effect by horror games like Dead by Daylight or Friday the 13th. Evolve, on the other hand, was basically the first camp counselor to get the axe so that maybe, possibly, others could live. 2016. This is going to be a hard one. I mean, this is the year that we got Pokemon Go. Also, Doom and Overwatch and Stardew Valley. You know, a lot of titles that still have legs today. So this is actually going to require a more detailed list of games and... Oh, there it is, Alakine's Gun. Yeah, I, I barely remember the few hours I played that game and am not remembering it fondly anyway, so... If you are not familiar with Alakine's Gun, you are completely forgiven. Actually, playing it made me feel like the dev team had forgotten about it before it even was released. Uh, basically, imagine Hitman. Yeah, it's basically that. But not like the new Hitman that actually came out that year. No, no, no. The old Hitman games that had, like, clunky controls and the disguises that were forming the backbone of your stealth gameplay, but, like, failed five minutes in, so it just became a shooting gallery anyway. Those. But Alakine's Gun is kind of worse because it also tried to be a historical piece that took place during the time of the Bay of Pigs and uh, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And um, it kind of destroys the weight of those events by not being, what's the word, good. Unless you were really looking forward to playing another Hitman game besides the much better one that had come out the same year, you were in for a wholly underwhelming experience. It, it didn't control well, it didn't look good, uh, the gameplay was clunky, everything about it just screamed bargain basement. My memory of it is vague, but I do remember a lot of the go to this place to get this thing so you can pass by this checkpoint so that you can get this next thing so that you can get past these guards so that you can get to the final thing and then you can leave the game. It was not this open world concept where you had multiple paths to achieve your objectives, which was what the actual Hitman series was doing, as it revitalized the genre, completely turning it on its head. Allegheny's Gun, on the other hand, was not nearly that ambitious. All it did was remind us of the experience that we had in older games before all the refinements and improvements to the formula, which is something no one asked for. Did you actually know this was the third installment in a series? Yeah. I didn't until I started researching this. Wait, it's um third installment in the Death to Spies series and was originally going to be called Death to Spies 3, Ghost of Moscow. Who knew? Another fun fact, Alakine's Gun is actually a famous chess move that was named after world chess champion Alexander Alakine. And somehow these facts alone are more entertaining than the game itself. The chess matches that Alexander Alakine was playing were probably more entertaining than this game. I had to struggle to remember this game at all. 2017. 
Yes, we had Battlefront 2, but you will never forget that game or the predatory microtransactions and monetization practices that it would spearhead, unfortunately, for many games to come. <laughs> Thanks, EA. Then there were the games that should be forgotten, like For Honor, and others that we never got the chance to remember, like the cancelled Scalebound. I actually had several competitors for this title in 2017, even though they might have been enjoyable at the time I was playing them. Like Guardians of the Galaxy, Seasons After Fall, or Agents of Mayhem. I mean, Phantom Dust got a re-release this year, and I barely even remember that that happened, let alone the original game. But then as I scrolled through titles from this year, one hit me like a gut punch. Not just because I forgot it, but because I really wanted to remember. Siberia 3 is the final installment in a point-and-click adventure series where you follow this lawyer, Kate Walker, through this almost otherworldly arctic landscape that sort of feels out of place and time. Yes, I played the first two games, and I liked them immensely when they came out. They had this wonderful, almost dreamlike atmosphere. Uh, the characters were really rich and interesting. Uh, the story design was very whimsical and fun. It just had this way of engaging you in a way that a lot of point-and-click adventures might not. And the story arc leads Kate from being this single-minded, self-centered character to being a real altruist who just wants to help an old man find a herd of lost mammoths. And it's lovely. So you can imagine how happy I was when I found out that they were finally going to complete Kate's story, which was left really up in the air at the end of Siberia 2. And you can imagine how let down I felt when it turned out that Siberia 3 was pretty tedious and felt very flat and didn't really have the magic of those first two games. It wasn't even engaging enough for me to complete the game. I was probably only halfway through, I think. And the scary part is, I'm the target audience. I'm the one that was already invested in the series. I'm the one that wants to see what happens to the characters that are already there. It's not that the narrative of Kate helping this group of nomads follow the migration of snow ostriches is a bad idea. It's that I forgot that the snow ostriches were even in it. If you can forget the phrase, snow ostriches, there's a problem. The reception from critics echoes these statements, most people feeling like this was less of a revitalization of the franchise and more a, a sad rehashing that added nothing to it. Maybe it has more to do with the waning interest in point-and-click adventures altogether. Like, for instance, you remember how uh, Dreamfall The Longest Journey was actually a really good game even though it had more disconnected storylines than Game of Thrones, right? Did you know that in 2014, they made a new game in that series called Dreamfall Chapters? Yeah, they did. Do you want to play it? I don't. And I should be the person who does. I can find out what happens to Zoe. But for some reason, my interest in the whole genre has really diminished in the last 10 years. Still, you could see Siberia 3 making some real strides forward in that genre, maybe innovating inside of a point-and-click adventure title, but it didn't do that. I mean, originally it was supposed to come out in 2010, but then it got, like, mired down in development hell. So it seems like the people creating the game had forgotten about it well before we even played it. 2018! Now, in a year that featured titles like Fallout 76 and Metal Gear Survive, the line between a bad game and a forgettable game is pretty clear. Because trust me, you're never going to forget those two games, no matter how horrible they were. Trust me, I have tried. <laughs> However, I realized that the most forgettable game of this year was going to have to be State of Decay 2, because I'm pretty sure most of the memories I have of that were actually from the original game. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, I really liked the first game, I just felt like there was a lot they could do in a sequel to improve upon that formula. Really improve the gameplay. Maybe you could actually issue orders to the rest of your squad. Maybe they would improve the user interface so it didn't feel like it was all on an Excel spreadsheet. You know, there were things that I was hoping for. Maybe it wouldn't be so tedious and maybe I'd care about the characters and there'd be a richer storyline. 
then State of Decay 2 came out and didn't do any of those things. It's so similar to the original that they're practically interchangeable. The one mechanic I remember them adding to SOD2 was the ability to refuel and fix your car. Yeah, that's what I was missing from my zombie survival title. Basic car maintenance. Thanks. Everything else about it felt like the game I had already played in the original, making it very easy to forget. There's this heavy emphasis on the State of Decay series, too, about just, like, having these timed events that are going on all over the map. So the thing about it is, is that you never concentrate on anything long enough to make memories. You're just constantly doing all of this busy work, going from point A to point B to try to constantly put out fires. So it's almost built to be forgettable by design. 2019, the year that just happened. All right, so yeah, Anthem was a thing, and it probably shouldn't have been, but you know what? EA and BioWare seem hell-bent on making sure that we never forget that game, so it's not going to be the most forgettable title. Also, this is a really hard year to deal with because it just happened, so figuring out what the most forgettable game from the last few months was is pretty tricky. Uh, there are some that I can see forgetting in the near future, like a Crackdown 3, a Remnant from the Ashes, or uh, Shenmue 3, which I haven't even played, but I can instantly tell you that I'll probably forget to play it in the first place already. Uh, and I say Crackdown 3 because it's pretty much nothing different. Same thing as State of Decay, you know, where it's basically nothing new over the first couple iterations. And Remnant because it's pretty much Dark Souls, where everything is either less interesting or more frustrating. So, yeah, sorry fans of Remnant. I know, I'm the outlier, but Souls likes in general just don't sit well with me. So, But when I started going through game releases from this past year... I realized that there were actually two titles that would have to share the top spot here because they were so similar to one another that I have trouble discerning what happened in each. I'm of course talking about the double dragons of neon-colored post-apocalyptic open worlds that were Far Cry New Dawn and Rage 2. On the surface, the visual aesthetic is really the only thing that sets New Dawn apart from other installments in the Far Cry series. Now, Rage 2, on the other hand, does something wholly different than the original game, but it basically turns it into one of those big open-world Ubisoft titles, the company that made New Dawn, and so it draws the comparison even closer between these two. Like, I can remember scrap heap cars that are covered in neon paint or mutated animals that are trying to eat off my face, but to explain which one that happened in is going to be tricky, because it probably happened in both. These games should actually serve as a cautionary tale, because it's not like they were bad. Like, they're enjoyable when you're playing them, but they're so similar to one another that it makes it hard for either one of them to have a real identity. The one thing I remember specifically about Rage 2 was that I had to go into my settings and change my view controls, because by default, it thought it would be a really great idea to make my x-axis move faster than my y-axis. Yeah, that didn't give me motion sickness at all. I kept playing with the joystick, thinking to myself, whoa, this is wow, we're panning fast, why is that? Until I went in and said, oh, the this, this is moving way faster than this is. Okay, great, yeah, thanks for that. Please don't do that again. The big thing I remembered from New Dawn was uh, the crossbow, uh, which makes it even worse when I looked up the weapon list and realized I was actually thinking about the saw launcher. When you can misremember the most memorable thing about a game, it definitely deserves its place on this list. Yes, somehow in 2019, two games swirled around each other so closely that they obfuscated all the content that each one individually possessed. So how does that bode for the future of gaming? Will, will games become so similar that you can't discern one from another? Basically, I'm asking if all gaming is just going to become Call of Duty. There was a there was that Call of Duty that had the the dog, right? Which one was that? 
Uh, oh, Battlefield 1. That's right. And so this has been the long, difficult journey to remember a bunch of games that I had forgotten, some that are worth remembering, some that are kind of built to be forgotten, and some that probably should be scrubbed from your memory, if you do remember them. <laughs> But are there games that I shouldn't have remembered better than the games that are on this list? Well, leave your suggestions in the comments down below. But note that I probably will judge you because you've just remembered that game that I thought should be forgettable. Right, see? There's a paradox here. It's a hard thing to do, folks. And, uh, oh yeah, while you're there, don't forget to dislike and unsubscribe. Because reasons. And I know what a lot of people are probably asking, why didn't you do a list of the most memorable games of the last 10 years? And uh, I'll tell you, that would have been way too easy. Way, way too easy. I, I could have made that list in a matter of minutes. Memorable games are an easy thing to put together. Forgettable games, oh, there's a challenge. But you know, maybe eventually I will. Maybe I'll put it out as a list or uh, do it as a Patreon thing, I'm not sure. But uh, if, if that sounds like a good idea, just let me know. And if you like this list or you wanted to see more obscure ideas put into some sort of list form, just uh, let me know. I'd appreciate the feedback. I don't want to be forgotten like all these games. Who does, really? These games got the Thanos snap. Uh, well, if, if Thanos also could erase the memories of those people. No, I guess the people that actually uh, got dusted uh, were pretty well-remembered. I think the only thing that actually got, like, forgotten was that Edward Norton was the original uh, Incredible Hulk. Edward Norton is the forgotten character <laughs> in Endgame more than anyone else. Something to think about. surprise of actually doing this video was that Game of Thrones, which was the biggest show in television for many, many years, and was at a real high point in 2012, right? Like, it, it, that, that it had just started. That, that actually had this pretty ambitious uh, RPG tie-in project, and that I did not even know it was a thing. Like, I probably remember something coming out saying that there was going to be this thing, but then I never played it, and I don't even know how I could get a hold of it, and I don't think I'd have much reason to, because apparently it was also pretty terrible. <laughs> but uh, that's just fascinating to me, that you can have a franchise that large with, like, a full video game tie-in created by a known studio, like Cyanide, and, um just lost to the wind. Proves no one's safe, folks. No one gets plot armor in the gaming world. This is not the Battle of Winterfell. <laughs>